Hi, and welcome to my vlog. My name is Kasper Hernandez Cordes. I'm a composer. I graduated from the Royal Danish Academy of Music in 2006. In this series of uh, videos, I'm excited to share my thoughts and ideas on a project that I've named Mycelium and Sound Collectives. So, the artistic research behind this project draws inspiration from various disciplines, including philosophy, modern life sciences, linguistics, neuroscience and quantum physics. So if you have an interest in the crossroads of art and science, I think you are in the right place. So, and what is this project about? Um, I'm working on this project that I call Mycelium and Sound Collectives because I am going to make a concert, an outdoor performance, which is scheduled to autumn 2024. So if you can imagine an ensemble featuring a saxophone player, an analog synth, and a rather unconventional player, which is the mycelium network forming what is called a fairy ring in the soil where the concert unfolds. So the essence of mycelium and sound collectives lies in exploring the live interaction between um, these three um, rather disparate um, performers and um, musician, machine and mushroom. So I'm curious to find out how I can create a framework where they can learn from each other, creating a distinctive form of communication during the performance. So grab a cup of coffee and sit back and let's together delve into the dynamics of this unconventional collaboration. So welcome to the journey. In today's episode, we are going to explore the question, can my computer learn to improvise music? In this installment, we'll delve into the intricacies of the machine aspect of our upcoming performance. For now, let's temporarily set aside the mushroom to machine dynamic and focus on the communication between musician and machine. While my project centers around a specific concert with a unique setup, I think that the insights that I'm trying to share in this video will extend beyond those boundaries. So whether you are interested in live improvisation with a computer or if you're delving into computer assisted composition, I think that the considerations discussed here are applicable to both these settings and probably also to a, var a variety of other settings. So can my computer learn to improvise music? Throughout this episode, we will tackle this question uh, head on, exploring examples of machine learning tools that are available to a composer as myself and can be harnessed in a live music context. So join me as we navigate through the artistic choices involved and all while we are maintaining focus and trying to avoid to get lost in too many nitty gritty details which is probably a tendency for myself. So without further ado, let's unravel the possibilities. Can our computers truly learn to improvise music? Let's explore this question. So I'm going to talk about machine learning and music and to make it more accessible, I'm trying to incorporate visual representations and sound examples. Additionally, I think it's crucial for you to note that I use a software which is known as Max MSP, uh, to try to work out these, to try out the models that I'm going to discuss. And Max MSP, if you don't know about it, it's a versatile visual programming language software. It's designed for music and multimedia. And I learned using it at the conservatory. So here I propose a, an overview of the different models that I'm going to be talking about. So uh, first of all, we have our loop pedal and then we have a sequencer and then we have a third one which is what I call a sequencer plus randomization. Then I'm going to talk about two uh, machine learning models that are more what we understand as machine learning models which is the Marco model 
and then finally about uh, what we call neural networks. So these are the uh, aspects that I'm going to be talking about. Um, now to start with the loop pedal, uh, I probably I think that many people are familiar with this uh, tool, which is a simply a machine that will re repeat the exact recording of a piece of music that you are uh, playing. Um, and in order to see how this works, I have uh, created a um, Max uh, patch that will show this. Yeah, so I have created a very very simple loop pedal here in Max MSP. And as you can see, uh, there is an ADC, which is an analog to digital converter, which is set to my microphone. And uh, here you have a buffer, which is the duration of 2000 milliseconds. And I can just record something. I have my piano here. And uh, normalize this. And then we can turn on looping. And then just turn on the playback. Moving on to our next candidate in the machine learning world, uh, we can talk about the sequencer, which is a musical tool used to create and control a series of musical notes or events in a predetermined order. Commonly it's found in synthesizers and keyboards, and it allows musicians to craft melodies, rhythmic patterns, and dynamic compositions. I have a Beringer Crave, uh, which um, I'm going to show you as an example, which is a synthesizer that has its own built-in sequencer. So look at, let's look at the hands-on capabilities of this sequencer, and later we will compare it to its digital counterpart in Max MSP. Yeah, so here I have my um, Behringer Crave, and as you can see, it has a sequencer module here. Uh, this is a kind of keyboard and in order to use the sequencer I press the recording button here and then I just go about putting each note at a time in and then I can just press play and it will play what I just created. I can also modify the tempo So as you can see in the Behringer Crave, you have a lot of options to control the sequencer. You can um, you can use it as a dynamic tool uh, to allow you to program and play a series of musical notes um, or events in a predeterminate order. So you can use step buttons and uh, controls, and you can set the pitch. Uh, you can control the length and timing of each step and of the sequence. So this hands-on approach to uh, creating musical patterns, it provides a tactile and immediate way to generate rhythmic and melodic elements. So let's explore the computer version of a sequencer in Max MSP. So as you can see, I've made a very, very simple uh, MIDI sequencer here in Max MSP, and uh, we can see that we need to combine it with my uh, MIDI keyboard, which I have here. It's a, uh, a normal piano, which I've always also in the form of a MIDI piano. So um, I can uh, record a MIDI sequence. Stop, and then I can play it. Now, um, so the computer records MIDI events, which are a combination of pitch, velocity, and duration from a MIDI keyboard, um, and it's similar to a loop pedal. However, the sequencer can also be used uh, to play different instruments. 
and this will add some versatility to the playback. So I can change the instrument here. I can put another instrument. I'm not sure which one it's going to be, but let's listen to it. That was maybe a Fender Rhodes or something in, in, along these lines. And let's put another one. This um, sequencer could also be controlling a, an external um, synthesizer like the Crave I was just showing you. And this adds, from my, from my perspective, some other kinds of possibilities than using the sequencer which is built in in the um, Crave. And I'm going to get back to this in a moment. Because now we're going to have a look at the third example of what I'm calling a machine learning tool, which is basically a sequencer, sequencer where you are adding some randomization. And this is not the case of the Behringer. It has some predetermined options, but it has some limitations. So what I'm going to show you is an example of a Max MSP patch, which has combined a sequencer, a MIDI sequencer with randomization. Here we go. And I have to ask for your um, pardon for showing you such a messy patch. But anyway, I hope that it will illustrate my point. So what's going on in this patch? Well, first of all, uh, we are going to check if the MIDI in is coming from my piano, which is the case now. And then we want to start recording. Now, um, what's happening here is that let's start with choosing a different instrument and let's try to play it back. Okay, so I suppose you have already guessed that with this invention, which is something that I just created because I needed to do it, uh, it involves um, randomization in the sense that during the playback, the recorded MIDI sequence undergoes alterations through random processes where uh, there are variations in tempo and transposition and velocity. Now, while loop pedals and sequences and even random sequences are fundamental tools in music production and performance, I think it's important to note that they operate more as creative tools than as examples of machine learning as such. So let's go back to the loop pedal and it records and plays back audio loops, allowing musicians to layer sounds However, it doesn't inherently possess the ability to learn or adapt based on input or context. It operates based on predetermined commands, making it more of a real-time recording and playback device. And the sequencer. Um, now they are found in synthesizers and other electronic instruments. They are used to program and playback sequences of musical events and they provide precise control over pitch and timing and other parameters. However, traditional sequences, they follow a programmed set of instructions without learning or adapting to new data. So now we are going to turn to our fourth um, model, which is the Marco model, and that represents, I think, a higher level in the realm of actual machine learning. This model is particularly interesting due to its ability to predict the likelihood of events based on past occurrences. 
In the context of music, the Markov model can analyze sequences of musical events and predict the probability of specific events occurring next. So I've chosen to include this model in our discussion uh, because MaxMSP provides a convenient tool which is known as ml.marco and that model is integrating the Marco model directly into the software and this allows us to explore and experiment with the unique capabilities of the Marco model in the context of music uh, composition and generation. Now turning to our fifth um, member of the family of um, uh, machine learning in music, uh, I want to just touch upon neural networks. Then they represent a very powerful class of machine learning techniques, of course. In the software MaxMSP, these techniques are accessible through an object which is called ML.MLP, which is denoting machine learning and multi-layer perception perceptron neural network, MLP. Um, although I want, I'm not going to delve into the uh, extensive detail here, I think it's important to know that this model holds promise for handling intricate patterns with interrelated parameters. This capability makes it potentially more accurate in generating nuanced outputs, particularly when dealing with complex um, compositions or improvisations. Now going back to the Marco model, I think this will it's going to be our initial focus because it has more in depth in the in the following. It's important to note that while neural networks, like you know ChatGPT, they are based on intricate structures, the accessible ML.MLP object in MaxMSP is a very simplified version and but it might be promising for certain applications. So recapping our exploration, we began with traditional tools like loop pedals and sequences, essential for music but lacking machine learning. Moving up, the Marco model adds predictive elements for analyzing and anticipating musical events. Finally, we explored neural networks um, such as ML, MLP and MaxMSP, which they are capable of intricate pattern handling and nuanced output generation in complex compositions. Now, as we delve deeper, remember our primary focus will be on the Markov model. Um, but anyway, why should we use which model? So the next step involves our endeavor to teach the computer the art of improvisation and composition achieved by feeding it with pieces of improvised music uh, or composition. This intricate process demands careful consideration and numerous choices. Uh, to gain a conceptual overview, let's approach it systematically. Now our path forward entails experimenting with each model and assessing their output. But the models, they vary in complexity. Some are simpler, while others are more intricate. Simi similarly, some models are, only, are easily understood, while others remain more opaque to the user like myself, who I'm not an expert. Ultimately, all, it all boils down, I think, to finding the right trade-off between complexity and control. So to illustrate this, I'm going to represent it in a matrix which, which has complexity on one axis and opacity and control on the other. So this is a question about um, how to represent these models in a way where I, as a composer, can find out where should I put my efforts. Um, if I was to place these five examples of machine learning in music on in this matrix, I would definitely put the loop pedal here because it's very simple and it's also very easy to understand what's going on inside it. So the next uh, one will be the sequencer, which is a little more complex. It has a little more options. Uh, it's a little less uh, accessible, but it's still very easy to understand what's going on. Now the third one, which is the uh, my invention, which is a random 
optimized sequence or a sequence with random uh, elements. Um, I would put it here. It's a little uh, more complex. Um, it has some more options, but it's still quite understandable what's going on. And then we go further on to the next one, which is the Marco model, and it becomes more complex, more opaque. And then in the end, we have the neural network, which is extremely opaque. Like in ChatGPT, nobody actually knows what's going on inside it. So it, it will render, it will give you a lot of uh, detailed uh, things, uh, but it is probably also very, very difficult to know what's going on. So you have much less control. So if we are going to interp interpret this matrix, I think we could understand that the more complex the model is, the more opaque it becomes. While complexity may enhance fidelity to the model data, it comes at the expense of transparency. That is, our understanding and control over the process as a composer or whatever you're, you are working in. So to draw a parallel with everyday life, you could think about instances when you need to choose, for example, a means of transportation. So do you need a bicycle or do you need a uh, cheap car or would you go for the self-driving car? So the matrix I'm talking about it mirrors considerations from an engineering standpoint. It has to do about technical choices within the machine learning process, and it prompts inquiries into practicality and control. Now, going further, uh, I think it makes sense also to look at it from a different perspective, and we can approach it, the process, from what I would call a philosophical standpoint. So here the choices that we delve into, they are questions of agency and the balance between sameness and difference. So let's have a look at this matrix that I've built up here. Um, so here we have uh, on one axis, we have otherness and sameness, which is to say that we are talking about whether the model um, we're using uh, will uh, reap uh, present the the data that we are feeding it with in a very f uh, in a high fidelity manner or if it's going to produce something which is different from what we are fed it with and then on the other axis we have what I could co would call the generative aspect that is to say does it um, generate something uh, by itself or is it simply just reproducing what we have fed it with and in order, if we want to f uh, f feed or fill in these uh, five models in this matrix, this is what I'm coming, uh, that this is my result at least. So I would definitely place the, um, well, it's missing here, but here is supposed to be the loop pedal, which is very reproductive. And it also very, it has a high degree of fidelity to the, uh, the, the model data, it simply just repeats it. And on the other end of this um, uh, parameter, we have the neural network model, which is very generative. It creates something uh, which uh, comes f like from, as an intelligent agent, it's very generative. However, it's also very close to the, f the feeded data the data that we've provided it with. And so in this uh, area here, I would place the, um, the sequencer with randomness. It can come up with something completely different from what you would expect. It's, it's very um, creative in this sense. It's also uh, somewhat in between generative and reproductive because it has the input, which is a sequence of notes that it will uh, change according to certain parameters. So depending on how you use the, the, um, the randomness and how you, uh, how you design it, it will be more or less uh, generative. Now the Marco model, I place it here um, because it's not as um, generative as the neural network, but it might be that this is why I'm tending to want to use this as a model now, it might be representing some more otherness than the uh, neural network. Um, 
But let's again take a look at an everyday life situations where you would have a similar kind of dilemma going on. So if we compare this with a choice of partner, this might be a life partner or it might be a work partner. Would you rather have a very intelligent person who would simply just copy what you're doing? Or would you have someone who would be really not that intelligent but uh, and doing the same? Or would you rather have someone who represents some otherness, a more independent person that would be providing something different from what you have come up with yourself? While we haven't conducted all the necessary experiments for a complete understanding, my intuition suggests that the most intriguing artistic solutions, they reside in the middle ground. So it might be a sweet spot where it strikes a balance between com control and complexity, between sameness and alterity. Although the MLP model appears more accurate, starting with simpler models such as the Marco model seems to be a sensible approach. So let's begin our exploration with the macro model and this is going to be the what I'm going to deal with in a future uh, video. So thanks for watching and um, please subscribe and also I would very much like you to uh, share your comments and ideas and give me some feedback. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.